please be seated. I have an old, old friend who uh, I don't see a lot anymore, but been friends for a long time, and he's serious about his about his faith. He has the kind of faith that is lively, enduring, and humble. And as an adult, he has been committed to the life and the ministries of the congregation in which he was raised, and he's exercised a lot of leadership there. And because this is a, a Baptist church, part of the practice and the tradition is, is something like what you or I might think of as an altar call. I don't, I don't even know if they use that word. I just know that there's uh, some opportunity in the course of worship to come forward and make a, a public commitment of faith. And so I asked my friend one time about his, his experience. I wasn't asking him about a particular day. I was just asking about his, his general experience of being called into the life and ministries of the church. And he described a day in his distant past. Uh, and he told it very straightforwardly. It wasn't grandiose it wasn't self-satisfied but he he told the story uh, of making that commitment and and remembering coming forward in the church as if being pulled by an irresistible physical force out from the pew up the aisle and toward the front hold on to that image for a minute and think about this See, I am sending you out like lambs into the midst of wolves. I have given you authority. Lord, in your name, even the demons submit to us. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy, yet nevertheless, do not rejoice at this. It's a very different dynamic. My friend's story is an image of being called being called in and then the gospel lesson is about being sent out and it's easy if we're, if we're not cautious in how we think about it and how we talk about it it's it's easy to muddle those two things up and certainly a, a full life in christ involves both being called in and being sent out but those two things are not the same for one thing that that being called in peace it should and does, I think, inspire, uh, inspire a kind of humility that is really necessary for the being sent out. But sometimes by the time we get sent out, we've lost track of that. So the, think about your own experience. What, whatever experience you might have of having been called, of having been called into a life of faith, called into community, uh, with God in Christ, called into the life of the church, called into ministry. It's an experience where God is doing something. You're aware of God doing something in you. It might even feel like God is doing something to you. And in that, there is this, uh, that's where the humility comes in because there's this sense of powerlessness. Like my friend who described and, and the, the term he used, and this is someone who grew up around farming, said, it was as if I had a bull ring through my nose. It was a, a sense of powerlessness. Which in, those can be moments uh, of deep gratitude for the, for the awesome majesty of God, for life itself, for being included in the love of God that animates us and animates the world. There's, there's humility in that. Now, being sent is a whole different thing. And in the gospel, when Jesus sends out the 70 this morning, he sends them out from the very beginning with a warning. Now, don't think you're all that just because I'm sending you out. Do not rejoice that the demons submit to you. Now, this passage never fails to remind me of a, of a, a powerful sermon that I heard uh, at, in, the, in what's called the Chapel of the Good Shepherd, which is the, the seminary chapel at General Seminary, uh, which has, a, unlike this room, is a lot of really ornate um, statuary. 
there's, you know, apostles and prophets in, in great detail and in stone, including, uh, including right up above the altar in the center, um, Jesus holding a lamb. It's the chapel of the Good Shepherd. So, so there I was uh, listening to a sermon and the preacher pointed to that and asked us to consider that lamb that Jesus is holding, cradling. It looks as though the lamb has just been, just been gathered up into safety, into the safety of Jesus' arms. And then she said this, I am sending you out as lambs into the midst of wolves. That is not what good shepherds do. That is really bad shepherding. You don't send the lambs to the wolves. So Jesus is complicating this thing about, about sending, about what it means to be safe. He says on the one hand, he says, uh, these things will not hurt you. But then on the other hand, he says, do not rejoice. Like this is not a magic wand. Go out into the world like a superhero and tame the demons. You're safe, they won't hurt you, he says. Meaning we presume that you, you, we are forever held in the love of God, but that doesn't always make it uh, a picnic, right? And certainly for Jesus himself, we know uh, that the, the following the call and then the being sent to the world involves a lot of sorrow and pain and powerlessness and the humility that comes with that. So, so Jesus addresses that this morning um, with this distinction, which I love, I, I love to find this in scripture because it's a distinction that preachers and theologians like to talk about. And sometimes I wonder if we just made it up to have something to talk about, but, but here it is in the gospels and it's the distinction between power and authority. If you look at the, if you look at the text, it says the, the only people who have power in this text is the enemy. I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Authority is the authority of God's truth and God's love, but it doesn't necessarily come with power. Think of the authority of love in Jesus' pacifism. Think of the authority of the love of God that we see in the cross and no power at all, no power at all. So being sent like lambs into the midst of wolves is a whole different thing. The only power that these people who are sent seem to have in this story is the power to shake off, wipe off the dust of their feet of those who will not receive them, which is a very poignant image. I don't know if you think about in your own life the times that you have been called and the times that you have been sent, the times that you have prayed or just been in dilemma about what to do about a ruptured relationship. That is a very stark image, wiping the dust off your feet and leaving. And yet the kingdom of God has come near. So. One of the things that I think is going on here is when we, when we think about the difference between being called and being sent, being called very often can feel, uh, can feel very individual. In fact, in the gospels, you know, Jesus says to the, to the guys on the shore, come on, follow me. And they follow, they're powerless, they come along. Um, it, it's about, it's about self-discovery often. It's about getting in touch with with some aspect of yourself that you, that you begin to recognize as, oh, this is, the, this is uh, who, who God created and called me to be. And so so that, that, that first part answering call, being drawn in to life in Christian community, being drawn into to a life of faith can, can be very individual. And then the being sent out is very complicated because it has to do with community and, and how we, and how we live together. One thing we know about the human community, 
if we're gonna if we're gonna dare to say the kingdom of God has come near, we've got to we got to set the ground rules here. Right? We gotta we gotta have a couple uh, expectations. One of which is that there is no internal division within the kingdom of God. So when the when the dust is wiped off the feet, it's not a boundary about who's in the kingdom and who's out. It's, you know, there was an encounter. There was an encounter that perhaps needs to, to, wait, uh, to wait for another day. In community, the best that we can do is to seek to be a living sign, a living sign to the world of, of how God has created and called all people to live together. So this is true of, this is true of, uh, of a parish community. It's true of the church at large. It's true of nations being called, uh, being called to be a model, a model, not the real thing, not the end all and be all, but a model of the kingdom of God, a model, a, a thing that points to it, that when we're at our best, and as I've said before, I don't like to speculate about exactly how often the church is at its best, <laughs> We could argue about that, but at our best, what we're supposed to be doing is, is enacting, enacting this thing that's like, oh, that's how, that's how it could be. That's how, how God is calling us to be. And, you know, of all the ways that, that sort of Christian, uh, Christian imagery and Christian cosmology has, has intertwined itself with American history, that's one of the ways, right? That's, that's where we get the idea of, uh, of, of this nation as the, the city on the hill and, the, and, and to borrow the image from Isaiah, the light to the nations. So, but if we're going to go there, we've got to remember there's no boundary within the kingdom. It cannot be. It cannot be that if we are different from others, either as Christians or as Americans, it simply cannot be that it's because God has special favor for us. It cannot be that, that we have priority. It cannot be that we're in a favored category. So to, to illuminate this, I wanna, I wanna talk for a minute about some of the verses that are missing here. And those of you who, uh, who are deeply familiar with chapter 10 of Luke's gospel, I'm sure you're like, wait a minute, they skipped some verses. <laughs> Yes, they did. So uh, we just read verses 1 through 11 and 16 through, through 20. So if you're interested in this, you can, uh, you can look it up when you get home. The verses that are missing there are, are pretty harsh. I think maybe the reason that the lectionary cut them out is because it's sort of, it's sort of startling whenever Jesus gets kind of, you know, upset. <laughs> What's missing there is Jesus uh, describing uh, in, in stronger language... <laughs> how it will be for these communities that turn away, that turn away, that don't accept the peace, the, the, the communities that will have the dust of the feet wiped off. And he says, woe to you, it will be worse for you. And then here you gotta have a little context, but you don't need to look this up if you just remember what I'm gonna tell you. The places Jesus sends these 72 are Jewish communities. They're Jewish towns. And he says, if you don't receive uh, if you don't receive this announcement of the kingdom, if you don't accept the healing, loving uh, care that's being offered by the 70, it will be worse for you than for, and, he, and then he names places that are foreign cities. He names places that are foreign cities. So there's this distinction, and I think we can make something of that without going down the road that so many Christians and so many Americans have gone down to our great detriment, which is the idea that, you know, God likes some better than others. Here's a little nugget of, of historical uh, foundation for that interesting sort of parallel between um, the, the beginnings of Christianity, which emerges into what's largely a, 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 a sort of tribal world that's defined on, by, by ethnic identity in the emergence of this country, uh, which is that it was kind of a revolutionary idea in the early church that any person could be one of this thing. Like that any person could be a Christian. You just, you, you make that commitment, come forward, right? Like my friend, you come forward, you make this commitment. Anybody can do that. 
Well, at our best, and I won't speculate how often this nation is at its best, but at its best, the same thing is true of anybody can be an American. We've all heard that, anybody can be an American. So the distinction is about the commitment one has made. The, com the, the distinction is about acknowledging that calling and being answerable to the, to the high standard of that, of that calling. So Jesus can say uh, to those who have been called in to, the, to, to receive the, the love of God as offered in this way, um, to reject that. You, you, you'll be worse off than those who've never heard it. But the kingdom comes near to both <laughs> equally, equally, because, because in the end, no one is in the kingdom until the whole world is the kingdom, right? There's no, you, 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 if there's a door that leads to somewhere outside the kingdom, then you're not in the kingdom yet. So in order, to, in order to be faithfully sent, in order to go to the world representing the, the, the boundless and awesome love of God, the equal and infinite love of God for every human and every community, it's, it's necessary to carry with us that, that sense of, uh, of powerlessness and humility that comes from being from being first called and so and so my prayer my prayer for for us for this community for the whole church uh, is that is that when we when we carry that that sense of humility with us that sense of of God being the one with the power and the authority, uh, that when that when we go to the world, it would be it would be experienced as as the kingdom coming near. And I, the way the way for that to happen uh, is to bear in mind this the, the the humility, the powerlessness of first being called. In order in order that we go not for our own glory, not for uh, the, the, uh, the perceived good of the person we have gone to, but for the whole world. So this, this intertwining of, of national life and our, and our life in the church is, is always tricky. The prayer book doesn't always get it right, but it's pretty good. <laughs> and I, I, I've, been, I've had many conversations in this church and other churches about um, about what it means to, you know, to pray for the nation, to pray for the president, to pray for the armed forces, to pray for, uh, to pray for um, legislatures and elected officials. And the, the piece of it that I cling to is that idea that reminds us uh, that there is no inside and outside in the kingdom of God. And, and so we need to pay attention to the clause in the prayers that starts with that. That's the thing that tells us what we're praying for. So when we pray for, uh, for the president, for the Congress, for the courts, for legislatures and, and those in positions of authority, there's that phrase that comes after, that they may, that they may make wise decisions for the welfare and peace of what? Of the world, for the welfare and peace of the world. So that we could uh, experience our own call in and our own sending out as, as pointing at the welfare and peace of the whole world. Amen.